Hi everyone, welcome back to Epic Chess, the channel that helps you improve your chess fast. Before I dive into today's video, I do want to acknowledge that I have a terrible moustache right now. Uh, I'm growing it out for Movember, uh, which is a great cause that helps raise money uh, and awareness for men's health issues. So yeah, that's why I've got this tash going on. Not the best thing in the world. Uh, I can't really grow them, but okay, I'm giving it uh, a go. Uh, so you'll have to excuse that one. What I want to cover in today's video though, on with the chess, is the top five positional chess concepts, to my mind anyway, and these five positional chess concepts will massively help any chess player. They're five very simple concepts individually, but they have a very powerful cumulative effect when you actually combine them together, and you'll find yourself skyrocketing your results if you can start doing these things in your games combining them all together harmoniously. So without further ado, we'll get cracking on with the first one. The first positional chess concept that I want to cover that every chess player should know is improve your worst piece. And I want to use this position on the board here to demonstrate this concept. Now it stands to reason, you know, chess is like an army and you're throwing your forces at the opponent, they're doing the same back. And it stands to reason that if you've got a part of your army which isn't playing in the position, then that's holding you back. You need all your forces participating in the attack or the defence of your position if you're going to truly make the most of your forces. So if you've got a piece on the board which is a bad piece, not contributing, then you want to improve that piece as a priority. And that's the first positional concept here which you really need to be aware of. So if we look at White's position here, there's a couple of pieces which spring to mind and I covered this position on a recent video in fact. So the Knight on C2 and the Bishop on E2, those are the two pieces which jump out here as needing improvement. The Knight needs improvement because it's struggling for jumps. It can't jump into D4 because that's blocked out by a pawn. E3 is blocked by this pawn controlling that square. It could jump into b4, but then say this knight moves away, suddenly that knight is just stranded on b4, and with an a5 push, it's gonna be backpedaling very, very soon. So somehow it needs to re-maneuver into the position, and once it does that, then this bishop can actually improve itself because it's currently stuck behind these light pawns, so, it's, so it could come on this kind of journey. So in this position, white played knight to a1, and this starts a really lovely maneuver coming into the b3 square and then later into this c5 square, which is now an outpost square because of how these black pawns have advanced and it's therefore left this weakness behind. And if we imagine this pawn coming to b4, it would solidify that knight on that square and you've got a lovely knight suddenly uh, solidified on that outpost in the enemy position. So that's concept number one, improve your worst piece. For concept number two, I've jumped to this position here which arises out of the London system. So White has played the London system, they've put the bishop out on f4, outside of the pawn chain. They've set up this pyramid of pawns here in the centre of the board. And Black has played in a very typical fashion. They've pushed the pawns to d5 and e6 in the centre here. We've also got pawns on b6 and c5 of course. But with the way these pawns have been pushed, it's left a nice juicy square on e5. Now, it's not to say that that e5 square couldn't be covered at a later point by black with an f6 pawn push. Plus, we can see that the knight and the bishop are eyeing up that square as we look at the position here. But what I want to come to now is that knights belong on outpost squares. So when you have these nice outpost squares, you know, jump a knight into them as soon as you can. And here we can see the power of that. White plays knight into e5, immediately advancing into the opponent's position. We can also note that if the knight were to take here, we recapture with the pawn and we're actually winning a piece because of that pawn fork. So that's not an option for black here. If black were to take with the bishop, well, okay, that could be played. But now after pawn takes, knight drops back to d7, pawn to f4, Black's now given up the bishop pair, and so white can have these very powerful bishops later in the game. And we can also see that white has grabbed some space here through this exchange of moves. So running back here to this position, 
That's why white jumps the knight in, knight to e5, because after black responds with, say, queen to c7, now we can push f4 and further solidify that knight. We even have the option now of recapturing with the f-pawn to open up the f-file for a rook. If we just come back and move here, let's say white had castled, black could actually now play queen c7 straight away, and this is a subtlety, but by doing this, it now means that if white jumps into e5, well now we can take, and after recaptures, we take with the bishop, we've lost the pawn. And so that's why by playing in this move order of the knight jumping in first before castles, white gives that option of occupying the square before black can play queen to c7. So this is our positional chess concept number two. Get your knights onto outposts. My third top positional chess concept is focused on the other minor piece, which is the bishop, of course. And this one is all about don't block your bishops. Now, bishops have such a long, powerful scope, raking down diagonals, of course, that you don't want them to be blocked out of the game by your own pawns or your own pieces. And so that's really at the heart of this tip. So if we look at an opening here, if we look at the London system, which white plays by bringing the bishop out to f4, We'll play through a couple more moves here. So let's say we have knight to f6, say pawn to e3, pawn to e6. Now we can see that this dark squared bishop on f4 is technically a bad bishop because it's on the same color square as its own pawns in the center of the board. But what we've done through this opening is activate that bad bishop so that it's outside of the pawn chain. So now even though it's a bad bishop, it's an active bad bishop. And so this is a great example of how to put this positional concept into action. We can see that by bringing that bishop outside of the pawn chain, it's now not actually blocked by its pawns, and so it's playing an active role in the game, cutting down this diagonal. The other thing we can note here is that the light squared bishop on f1 can freely develop into the game here, moving through these light squares uninhibited because of the fact that the pawns are on the dark squares here, d4 and e3. And so this is why the light squared bishop in this position is the good bishop, the dark squared is the bad bishop, although we've activated that bad bishop as previously said. Now one thing to note when it comes to not blocking your bishops is that there are certain positions where blocking the bishop is okay if you foresee the fact that it's just a temporary blocking of the bishop. So I just want to briefly draw your attention to a line in the queen's gambit declined which goes like this. So here we have the start of the queen's gambit declined. Now, the most common and popular move in this position is actually pawn to e3, blocking in that queen's bishop and making it an entombed bad bishop, or so it appears on the surface, going against the principles we just discussed for the most popular move in this line, which seems strange, of course. But when you start to understand this position, you realize that white has an idea in mind here of rapidly developing the king side and then being able to later break in the center with e4 which will liberate this queen's bishop so if we just play through a few moves here and see how this actually unfolds we can see that both sides are actually getting their pieces out here now black also has a bad bishop here on c8 which is undeveloped tucked behind its pawns but again black has foreseen a way to bring this into the game and it starts in a moment so we have castles castles and now black takes on c4, forcing the bishop recapture, and now pawn to b5, a very common move in these structures. Bishop drops back to e2, it could drop to d3. Now we have bishop to b7. So developing this bishop along this dangerous long diagonal, and again, black has foreseen that after a pawn break to c5, this bishop will then be liberated and brought into the game. White now plays rook to d1, lining up against the queen and the half-open d-file. Black plays queen to c7, and now we have the freeing move, pawn to e4. And suddenly, this bishop on c1 is now coming to life, coming into the game. So it can come out to g5, it can come to e3, and basically we can see that that bishop is no longer a bad bishop. It has a scope of a diagonal to work along. So this is the only thing to say about not blocking your bishops. If you're temporarily blocking them because you can foresee that there's going to be a change in the character of the position in the center of the board or the part of the board where your bishop is blocked, then it's not such a big deal to do so, especially in the opening stages. But as a general rule of thumb, it's something you really want to look out for. 
don't block out your bishops. They need those open boards to really fire down against your opponent and do some damage. My fourth top positional chess concept is very similar to the last one, but this time it relates to the rooks and it's all about activating your rooks. So in the same way we want to activate the bishops and get them firing down the board, the same is true of rooks. There's no point having your rooks just staring at pawns like the rook on f2 is here, or this rook on the a file is just staring at the a pawn. You want to activate them, bring them into the game, get them firing down at your opponent's pieces. So there's a couple of good moves for white in this position. I mean, white is dominating the game here, so there are many different ways to play. Playing f4 is a very good move in this position. It wasn't the move that was actually played by Paul Morphy uh, because this is a game of uh, Paul Morphy, the famous 19th century American grandmaster. Now, he didn't play this move, but it, you know, it would have been a great move because suddenly we're creating an open file for this rook down the F line. And this is one of the key things to say, really. If you want to activate your rooks, then bringing them to open files, which are already open, is a great way to activate them. And that's kind of one of the more obvious ways to activate them. The other way is to create the activity yourself through either pawn breaks or rook lifts. So if white had played this f pawn forward here, we can see that if black captures, well, they can't do that in this position, they'd lose the knight on d4. But if we imagine the knight wouldn't be on prees, if they captured with the pawn here on f4, suddenly either the bishop or the rook can recapture, and that rook is now banging the game, looking at this sensitive f7 point, which is also lined up with the c4 bishop. And the other way we can bring rooks into the game beyond pawn breaks is the way in which Paul Morphy decides to play here, which is by playing rook to a3. And this is a very common idea in chess, which is rather than look to break open the rooks by making pawn breaks, instead you bring the rook across so it sits in front of the pawns and attacks the king in that manner. So this is called a rook lift in chess. And we can see that Morphy here is lifting the rook along the third rank. The third rank is the most common way to lift your rooks, as you can imagine, because if the pawns are sitting on the second, then coming to the third is the most common way to lift your rook. And if we play forward a couple of moves here, we can see this plan in action. So black plays knight into e7. Now we have f4 activating the other rook. Bishop to e6, desperately trying to trade off some of white's active pieces. Bishop takes, knight takes, f5 actually hitting that knight. And although this keeps the file closed, what Morphy is seeing here is that he can soon come to f6 and then black will be forced to take anyway. So knight to d4 is played here. And now we have rook to g3, completing this rook lift, hitting this g7 pawn, and now we can see that both white rooks are very active, the rook on g3 and the rook on f1. So a really instructive way of playing here with the rooks from Paul Morphy, and a key one to remember when it comes to my fourth top positional chess concept, activate your rooks, don't let them get blocked out of the game. My fifth top positional chess concept is all about activating the queen. And to show this concept in action, I want to use a lovely game played between Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So in a recent Blitz match. So here it's Carlsen's play, he has the white pieces. Wesley's just played the bishop into d5, recapturing a knight. And so, you know, you can have a pause of the video in this position and think how you might play, thinking about the concept of queen activation. So here Magnus plays queen to g4. So it's a really nice positional concept to note in this position. Instead of just playing a standard developing move like knight to f3, Carlsen actually develops the queen early, activated it, and immediately puts pressure on the black position, making it difficult for black to develop this king's bishop on f8. And this is a very justified moving out of the queen early in the game. Oftentimes we say don't bring your queen out too early because it can be harassed by minor pieces. But when we look at this position, the knight that was on f6 was driven to d5 and then exchanged, so that can no longer harass the queen. The light squared bishop is on a separate diagonal to the queen here, so that won't be harassing the queen. So the only way to actually start hitting that queen and driving it away is by making pawn pushes, which Wesley started to do here. So Wesley played pawn to h5, hitting the queen. We had pawn to f4, and then pawn to g5, hitting the queen again. 
Magnus drops back to e3 now. So although Wesley's gained some time against the queen there, he has weakened his position through these pawn moves. Now you could argue he's gained space and actually they're not going to be big issues, these long-term weaknesses and there'll be more of a trump rather than a drawback. But with how the game pans out, we'll see that that's actually not the case here. So the way Magnus activates the queen here is already instructive up until this point, but I want to jump slightly later into the game because it's a really nice maneuver which he uses to actually finish the game here. So I'll whiz through these next few moves. We have pawn to a5 from Wesley, now a3, bishop b7, knight to f3, g4, knight to d4, knight to c6, now Magnus jumps the knight into b5, refusing that knight exchange. We have bishop to h6, hitting the queen, queen to c3. Bishop back to g7, attacking this e5 pawn. Magnus defends. We have d6, bd, cd, and now h3, trying to undermine this kingside structure. f5, hg, hg. The rooks get swapped off here. And now this is where I want to pause for a moment because we can see that through all of these pawn moves on the king side, Wesley has weakened these light squares especially, but in general we can see that there's lots of space around the black king here. So it's really instructive how Magnus now takes the time to activate his queen, even though it takes some moves to do so, he sees that it's worth doing it for the long-term position of his queen. So the queen on c3 isn't currently doing a great deal. It's blocking the scope of the b2 bishop. It's staring at its own pawn for the time being, and it's attacking a piece which is quite well defended by the b7 bishop, could later be defended by the rook, and then the queen could be a target on the c-line. So for these reasons, Magnus sees that that queen needs to be improved. So he plays queen to g3, the start of a really nice maneuver into the king side. What's really good about this move as well is it picks up the tempo on the d6 pawn because now that pawn is attacked by both knight and queen and only defended once by the black queen. So we have pawn to e5 from Wesley. Now queen to h2, coming to this dangerous h-file. The queen couldn't go to h4 of course because this is covered by the black queen. So white comes to the only other available square. We have king to d7, Wesley desperately tries to run away, whoops, Wesley's trying to run and now Magnus jumps into h7 to deliver a check with the queen. So I think it's just really instructive how the queen came from c3 to g3 to h2 to h7 and it took those three moves to really activate the queen but now that it's arrived on this dangerous side of the board the consequences are devastating it's hitting the king, it's hitting this f5 pawn. So we'll play a couple of moves through. We had knight to e7, blocking the check and defending the pawn. Now Magnus takes in the center, ripping open further lines against the black king if the pawn is recaptured, and it's all over at this stage. So we have queen to g8, desperately trying to swap queens, but here Magnus keeps his queen active, refuses the exchange. We have queen to h6, Wesley tries it again, queen to g6, and Magnus now just drops the queen back to d2, keeping that queen activated, not swapping for Wesley's inferior queen, and keeping the attack going against the black king. And here Wesley actually threw in the towel. It was too much to, to deal with in this position. So as you can see, these five top positional chess concepts are really geared up to activating your pieces, your queen, your rooks, your bishops, your knights on the outposts, improving your worst pieces, and that's a really big part of positional chess, is you want to get your pieces into the best positions where they can then either launch an attack or provide a defensive role or maybe do both in certain positions. And so positional chess really doesn't have to be super complex, you know, when you're actually thinking about how to play positional chess. This video hopefully will really help you understand that if you can improve your pieces in these key ways, then you'll really start to help your results. So I hope this video has been really helpful. If you do have any questions, please leave them down below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and I hope to see you again in another video. Thanks for watching.